as Heather mentioned, we, it is Palm Sunday today, so Phil's remit was as simple as this. It was, preach on Palm Sunday. That was it. Okay, so I will be faithful to my brother's um, command. Before we get into that, um, I'm going to say a question in a moment. I'd love you to shout out your immediate answer. This is the external processor's dream and the internal processor's nightmare. Here we go. What do you think of when I say the word Jesus? King? Salvation? Cross? Saviour, friend, wonderful, hope, God, love, Holy Spirit, wonderful. That is wonderful. And all those things are true about Jesus. I was gambling that nobody would say king, and none of you did except Heather, who ruined it all. No, she didn't. She's reminded us that Jesus, as well as all of those things, and you said them all, many of those. He's our friend, he's our saviour, he's the one that brings peace, he sends the Holy Spirit, he brings hope and salvation. All of those things that you said. He is also king. And that is essentially the message of Palm Sunday. If you want one of Phil's lunchtime summaries, the message of Palm Sunday is essentially Jesus is saying, I am king, but not as you conceive of it. Jesus is saying, I am king but not as you conceive of it. And we're going to dig in to the nature of his kingship uh, this morning. And I'm trusting it's going to speak to us. We're going to be in two different passages. You're a Bible-saturated church, so I figured I could get away with saturating you with two passages. The first one is Matthew 21, that you might be familiar with, verses 1 to 11, when we see Jesus declaring his kingship on Palm Sunday. The second one you might be less familiar with, uh, which was written about Palm Sunday, 500 plus years beforehand in the book of Zechariah. So we're going to look at, look at both. Let's look at the Matthew passage first of all. Matthew 21 and verse uh, 1 to 11, and the words are on the screen as well. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. This is a new text to you. This is the Sunday before Easter Sunday. So we're right now into Christ's final week, and this is the day that we celebrate today. Verse 3, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, brackets, Zechariah, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And that's the text we're going to dig into after this. Verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, and this is one of the best questions anybody could ask, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So a week out, from Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus is very publicly declaring and accepting his kingship and the public's uh, praise and worship and acclamation as a result. In verse 16, which I didn't read to you a few verses later, the Pharisees are typically outraged at what Jesus is doing, and they say to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus simply says, yes. Yes. In other words, Absolutely, I am the king that they are welcoming. And it's really one of the first times Jesus publicly agrees that he is the coming king, the coming Messiah, the coming one, the son of David that the scriptures have prophesied about for hundreds of years. But like I say, as much as he is confirming their view of his kingship, he is also redefining it by very deliberately doing what the prophet Zechariah said he would do over 500 years before. So if we're going to understand the kind of king that Jesus was intending to communicate, we need to look at this Zechariah passage that Matthew's quoted. We're looking at a bit more depth to see what kind of king is this? And how this morning is he going to redefine our expectations, whether we've been Christian for years and years and years, 
but we're not really sure if we are a Christian or want to be a Christian, Christ will always flip our expectations upside down many times, not least in the kind of king that he is. So we're in Zechariah now, chapter 9 and verse 9. Zechariah was a Jewish man. Uh, He wrote in the early part of the 6th century BC, and he wrote down what God said to him. Uh, If you're new to that part of the history of the Bible, in a real kind of snapshot, since the heyday of King David in like 1000 BC, uh, really Israel had kind of fragmented due to its own disobedience and rebellion against God. It fractured into two because of a civil war, a north kingdom and a south kingdom. God had said that actually as a result of that, they were both to be judged and taken into exile. They were. And the southern kingdom was taken into exile by Babylon. And then sure enough, God the also did what he promised and brought home a remnant because he hadn't given up on them. And he brought home a remnant of the southern kingdom of Judah back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the devastation of the city and the temple and so forth. That's the moment in which Zechariah is living. And it's not going so well. There is social disunity and political disunity and financial problems. Might sound familiar to today. And it's in that context that God speaks through Zechariah about the kind of king who's going to come and make all things new and all things right. So, it's a longish text, but um, like I said, Bible-saturated church, so I'm on good, I'm on good ground. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. That's Zechariah's way of speaking to the, the people of Judah. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey. And that's the passage that Matthew quoted about Jesus when he did what he did. Verse 10. I will cut off from the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. To declare Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones, and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish and new wine the young women. Old Testament prophetic scripture isn't always as easy to understand maybe as other parts of of scripture but it's just as beautiful and it whispers the name of Jesus and my point is if we're going to understand the kind of king that Jesus is saying he is on Palm Sunday we need to understand this text because he's very deliberately saying I'm the fulfillment of this Um, Freddie mentioned before that three points is the standard preaching format I'm going to go for five (laughs) I've never preached a five point sermon before you may wish I never had at the end of this uh, but we're going to give it a go. And the reason it's five, it was nine actually on Friday, so you're lucky it's only five. But it's my, my heart is that by the Spirit, we're going to just see, he's going to lift our gaze to the wonder of Jesus. All I want to do really is exalt the King to us this morning and ask for the Holy Spirit to help us do that, to see how wonderful and majestic he is, as well as be challenged by the kind of King that he is, um, because he does that as well. Holy Spirit loves to glorify Jesus says in John 16, 14, and my prayer is that he will do just that this morning. So here are the five things that we see about the surprising kingship of Jesus. Number one, he is humble rather than proud. I'm going to juxtapose two things each time. He is humble rather than proud. Verse 9, this is the one that Matthew and John both quote in their Gospels. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
And I think we kind of see that, maybe think, oh, that's nice. It's nice that Jesus would come in on a donkey. It's just, it's just typical of him being kind of nice. I think we miss just how extraordinary it is that he does this. It makes no sense then, especially in the ancient world, that a king would come in on a donkey. A king would come in on a, on a, on a horse or on an, on an elephant or on a stallion or a chariot. That's how kings would come in then. How do they come in now? They come in probably on a limousine or a carriage or a private plane. Donkeys. Don't make sense. Servants ride on donkeys in the ancient world. And that is partly what Jesus is trying to say. He is humble. Other translations would say he is gentle and lowly. A few years ago, um, we, when we had our aforementioned second child, Jack, he's four now, we had a home birth. Um, and after we'd had this, uh, I think we, Caroline, had given birth uh, to Jack, my job was to heat the water. Very important job did it excellently. Uh, after that, we, our midwife said, would you mind if a, um, a VIP came to visit you in your home in a, in a couple of weeks? We said, I mean, you're kind of in that stage of fuzzy exhaustion. Yeah, whoever, whoever, bring whoever you want. Um, but we can't tell you who it's going to be. We said, oh, okay. So it's this VIP person that needs, needs to be very secret. You'll find out the morning of the of the day. So the day came two weeks later, and we sort of vaguely tidied the house, made sure that Izzy was out of the way at nursery. It was just the three of us. Um, got a few biscuits and some tea and that kind of thing, and I vaguely made the house ready. And then at 11 o'clock, the doorbell rings, and in come these two people. One of them is uh, the senior midwife from the Kingston Hospital area, and the other person is a royal protection officer. And this person says, um, the Duchess of Cambridge, a.k.a. Kate Middleton, is going to come and visit you, if that's okay. Uh, she's doing a private tour around the borough of Kingston. Yesterday she was in hospital looking at births in hospital. Today she's doing home births. Uh, is that still okay? Yes. I don't know what else you say when you're asked. Um, another hour later, the kind of nice black Range Rover draws up. And we're thinking, is this actually happening in our little two-bed flat in Kingston? And the door goes, and I open the door. And sure enough, and obviously she's very much in the news at the moment, uh, there is the aforementioned Duchess of Cambridge. Um, and she comes into our home and sits on our sofa. And we talk for like two hours about babies and birth and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it was utterly surreal and very lovely and all the rest of it. And one of the things that came across... Uh, was, um, I'm not just saying this in light of her, her um, situation this week, she did come across as remarkably humble, remarkably down to earth. She just sat on our sofa, drinking our dodgy tea and eating a biscuit, um, looking, holding our little boy, happy to talk about babies and our family uh, and her passion for, for the you know, good start for the, for the youngest. It was just easy, down to earth, normal conversation. And yet, She's royal and global and impressive and, and beautiful and all the rest of it. And it was just a little snapshot. Of, it's, it takes you by surprise to be in the presence of royalty and find that it is humility is, is quite surprising. Of course, how much more so in the person of Jesus. It is mind-boggling. This king, this is the one that John in his gospel said was both God and with God at the beginning of all time. Him. And we're told he is humble and gentle and lowly. The one who is right now enjoying a continual tumult of angelic praise by millions and millions of angels all the time singing, holy, holy, him, gentle and lowly. That's what he wanted to communicate about his kingship. And as that wonderful song says, the king is in the room when his people gather in, in worship. And isn't it amazing that this same king in Matthew eleven twenty eight had already said, Come to me, anyone who is labor, anyone who labors and is heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am humble in heart, or gentle and lowly, other translations say, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what the king of the universe says. I hope there'll be some time just towards the end just to pray with each other and for one another. And I think for some of us, actually, that's our response this morning. It's just to be bowled over by the humility and the gentleness of our King. He says, you're burdened? Come. I just want to give you rest for your souls. Number two. This King makes peace rather than war. He's humble rather than proud. He makes peace rather than war. Of course, part of the reason why Jesus rides in on a donkey... It's because he's not riding on the horse, an animal of war. 
He's deliberately riding in on an animal of peace. Verse 10, Zechariah prophesies, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will proclaim peace to the nations. Again, that was quite shocking in the ancient world. People were used to kings and emperors and generals and Caesars who made war and not peace. That's how you establish the kingdom, by making war, by conquering and conquest. War established kingdoms, not peace. And yet Jesus said, I'm going to remove from my people, ultimately, the need for chariots and horses and battle bus. And in prophetic literature, you need to see often the prophets are seeing through like one, two, three stages. They're seeing to, to the kind of the now, the not yet, and the even further ahead. And Zechariah will be glimpsing that in bits. But in the short term, God is saying that he will give Israel, in the short term, peace among her neighbors. But ultimately, he's saying through Jesus in the long term, in the ultimate term, he will create a people group from every people group on the planet. Verse 10, his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Some of you will have spotted at the moment that that constant controversy that uh, people were sometimes seeing that chant around the Israel-Palestine conflict, the river to the sea, deliberately, you know, a very controversial thing to say about the nation state of Palestine and Israel and whose border is which. And I'm not getting into that in this moment. But what I am drawing out is that Jesus is... Uh, promise of the kind of nation that he will create far expands that far expands that from the river to the ends of the earth that's the kingdom that he is creating now and will one day create forever to the ends of the earth a local kingdom not a global kingdom it's what we're part of as phil's already hinted a part of this is a church part of the church so the corners of the earth and we're designed to reflect the promise that Christ, by the Spirit, is outworking now, and of course, ultimately, will outwork on his return. I mentioned we have a community at New Malden, we're going to meet this afternoon, um, and once a month, we flip our worship around, and rather than worshipping in this format of uh, the Bible, and singing, and praying, and so forth, we worship by going out onto the streets, and uh, making Jesus known. We've been doing it now for, uh, for a few months, and one of the wonderful things about being in New Malden, as you go out, and last week we did the same Easter eggs thing, like how could you go wrong? It's going to be some couple of weeks' time, would you like an Easter egg? Happy Easter. So you can do that tomorrow morning, unless you're bunking off school, some of you. Um, that's what we're doing last week. So we'll go out, some more prayer walk, some will offer some hospitality like that, and some will seek to offer prayer and share the gospel with people. And the other time we were out... I, we literally didn't speak to a white British person in, within an hour. It was a Polish person and a Korean person, and it was a Hindu, and it was Nigerian, and it was Azerbaijani, and it was Albanian. Just the nations just surrounded around, around us. And then last week when we did it again, we had this wonderful moment. Before we started, just like 30 of us, pretty fragile, just doing a little bit of training, a couple of little a cappella songs. As we were doing that, ready to go out, four people came and joined us, all of whom we'd met previous, on previous times out on the streets in our conversations. Had this Hindu lady that came in who's in this appalling situation of domestic violence and she had just begun to come in and receive some prayer. We had um, kind of British Nigerian guy, single dad with his two little boys, a couple of Polish ladies, one of whom was on crutches coming in. It was like, just a little thing, but also just quite a profound thing of the kind of family that God is building. And the fourth person came in was a doctor that we'd met, a very educated, uh, wealthy, switched on guy, and was just coming in to see what was going on. So it wasn't just like the nations are coming in with their, with their, with their poverty, of course not. It was the nations are coming in with their gifting. Some are coming in already Christians, some are coming in not yet Christians. It's just a little picture of what um, Jesus is building and will build. I just had a, I was like Phil was praying before, I just had a sense that maybe there's somebody here who God is speaking to about being a peacemaker among the nations. And that's reflected at, either in your community maybe or in your workplace, that he's calling you into that kind of fulfillment of what Jesus has done in us to then be an ambassador of in your context. That you're to be a peacemaker, a means by which there is peace and harmony, not to tick a diversity and equality tick box but to actually represent something of the kind of kingdom that Christ is building. I'd love to pray for people like that at the end. Number three, the king is also surprising because he gives rather than takes. 
The king gives rather than takes. This king doesn't come to raise taxes, to oppress the poor, to enrich himself like the kings of the ancient world. He came to give away. Did you catch some of the words in the text? To restore, to bless, to provide, to heal. Verse 11, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. I was pondering, what's a, what's a waterless pit speak of? I guess it speaks of somewhere, somewhere that is dry, waterless, and a pit speaks of somewhere that is deep. So I guess the question for some of us is, where have we run, where have we run dry? Um, I was like Phil, I had, had a thing about finances actually, that maybe there was someone who was thinking, that's where I've run dry, is in my finances, deep. Where are you just in over your head? It might be in the, the big dramatic stuff, you really feel like I'm just in over my head, I have no idea how to get out. Or it can be sometimes in the more subtle things. But verse 12, God says, I will restore to you double. Love that. Verse 17, how great is his goodness and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish and new wine the young women. This king loves to restore and to heal and to bless and to provide and even to restore far more than we could ask or imagine. Just listening to a testimony in our, in our church last week, we were recording it for the, for the rest of the church to hear. There's a young woman in our church who was telling her story uh, and she had... Um, got married uh, about three years ago. Her husband had kind of recently come to faith beforehand. They got married. She got pregnant. She gave birth to a little little girl. And then three, three months later, her husband left her, just out of the blue, said, I'm, I can't do this. I'm out. I'm not a Christian. And disappeared. And she was left as a new mum with a three-month-old baby and her marriage in pieces and, and no obvious home to live in or at least to call her own. And she just tells a story of how in the first year or so, in that place of absolute devastation, God the King provided and restored and was so generous in his provision, not least in a home. She said, given what the home was priced at and what I had, it was never going to meet. And through a number of different things, somehow this home became her home for her and her daughter. And it was way more than she ever, ever could have expected. As some of the trauma of what she'd been through began to work itself out, she developed chronic fatigue amongst some of another... Um, other other conditions and she talks about how that was pretty crippling she had to stop working um, and there was one night we had a kind of worship evening and encounter prayer worship night and uh, a couple of the, her friends started to pray for her uh, and committed to ongoing prayer and fasting for her i never even knew about this only found out recently they just very quietly said we're going to pray and we're going to fast until this shifts and the story was that her chronic fatigue did shift quite remarkably six months in the way the doctors were quite surprised about She's got back to full health. She's back to work. Is life perfect and easy? No. But there's been restoration. There's been healing. There's been blessing. It's what the king loves to do. And I was just also praying about that earlier on, thinking, I wonder for some of us where we just need to know this restoration of God, that waterless pit experience. And God says, I don't just see you in it. I want to draw you out of it. I want to quench you where you've gone dry. I want to bring you out of something that feels over his head. It's the kind of king that we have. Number four. We're almost there. This is a king of self-sacrifice rather than self-preservation. Self-sacrifice rather than self-preservation. In verse 12, we're told how the king is going to do all of these things that Zechariah promises. And it says, because of the blood of my covenant with you. Because of the blood of my covenant with you. And in the past, and in the present in which Zechariah speaks, he's talking about the sacrificial system of sacrificing a lamb, shedding a lamb's blood, uh, representing the fact that the wages of sin were indeed death, that blood was to be shed, but not upon the people, instead upon the lamb, so that the lamb would die, the sin was placed upon the lamb, and the people would go free. That was the blood covenant, if you like, that God had established. But in the future, Zechariah is hinting at a new covenant by blood that the king would enact. The final and ultimate lamb, the one that John the Baptist said, that's the lamb of God, talking about King Jesus the one whose sin could atone for all people, everywhere, for all time. And just to prove the point, a few days after Palm Sunday, on what we call Maundy Thursday, that Thursday evening when Jesus celebrated the Jewish Passover with his disciples, completely redefined it. 
Matthew 26, verse 20, 28, Matthew reports Jesus saying, For this is my blood of the covenant. What I'm doing now is a picture of what I will do tomorrow. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is our king. He doesn't hide away in a palace and just issue decrees. He doesn't stay with the generals way behind the front line. He's on the front line. He, he is the front line, you could say. He doesn't focus on self-preservation like so many leaders do. How can I protect what I have and who I am and my, what I've accrued? This king is in, in, involved in self-sacrifice. Goes to the cross in self-sacrifice. And he goes in self-sacrifice, we're told, not just for his friends, but for his enemies. Maybe people would die for their friends. People have died for their friends. People have laid their lives down for their nations. But for their enemies? What kind of king goes and lays his life down for his enemies? It's the kind of king that we have. The king who sees us, has seen us, and sees people in their rebellion from him, establishes the terms by which they can be reconciled to him, and they lays his own life down to make it happen. This is a king like no other. I was talking with a, a Hindu friend of ours, like us there, uh, on the a journey, thinking about adoption and fostering, and, and we were just having dinner on um, Friday evening. Uh, he was telling me how Krishna... It's a really lovely conversation. He's telling me how Krishna really is very, very similar to Jesus. We find in Krishna what you find in Jesus. And they hit one of the Hindu gods that Krishna too uh, died for sin, that Krishna too was, was raised again. Um, as we were talking, we at least, and it was a really good conversation, we at least agreed that although Krishna was said to have died, he didn't deliberately die on behalf of his enemies. He didn't deliberately die on behalf of all people that he would take their sin instead of them. Krishna may have died. Krishna may have said some helpful, good, moral things. He did not give himself in self-sacrifice for the sins of the world. It was a good conversation. So here's how the king comes. The king comes in humility and not pride. He comes in peace, not war. He comes to give, not just to take. And he comes in self-sacrifice, not self-preservation. Final one. There is another side to this king. This is the less palatable part of the sermon, maybe. There's another coming of the king. This coming of the king on Palm Sunday was also a, a forerunner of his second coming, of his returning as king. And when King Jesus comes again, I put it like this, he will come not in indifference, but in judgment. He will come not in indifference, but in judgment. He won't only come to make all things new, to wipe away every tear and sadness, to restore the creation, to resurrect the groaning creation, to resurrect our dead bodies, all of these wonderful things, to engage in an eternal marriage party and banquet with his bride, the church. He will also come in judgment. Eventually, the patience of God, he doesn't want any to perish. That's why we engage continually with making Christ known to our communities. He doesn't want any to perish, but at some point he will say, enough is enough. He will roll up the, the time on this age, the curtain on this age, and he will return the same king, but in a very different form. And it's hinted at in Zechariah's prophecy. And if you caught it in verses 13, 14, and 15, we heard talk of a, a warrior's sword aimed against the nations. We heard of God's arrow going forth like lightning. The blast of a military trumpet, of some degree of vengeance, the, the wine of wrath. These things were hinted at in verses 13, 14, and 15. You see, the Bible is really clear. The king will ride again but not on the back of a donkey. It'll be a very different sort of coronation. Revelation 19, verse 11. I'm not sure I put it on the screen, forgive me. Revelation 19, verse 11. This is John, the Apostle John, towards the end of his life, gets shown a vision of how God will roll up the end of this age and establish the new creation. Verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, not a donkey, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 12, his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings. And that's a description of the same king that rode in on Palm Sunday. It's one maybe we find a bit more difficult to read out and to compute. But that's the reality of how he will return. And scripture says that every knee, every knee will bow in that moment. Some in worship and in delight and others in fear and in trembling. And the reality, guys, is is stark. How we respond to the coming king on Palm Sunday dictates how he will respond to us when he comes again. How we respond to the humble servant king on a donkey determines how the warrior king astride a white horse will respond to us. And so I want to just land not just on that moment but partly on that moment to so that as those of us who are seeking to follow Jesus, make sure that we proclaim Jesus in all his glory. We proclaim him in, with all his urgency. We proclaim him not only as the one who is humble and gentle and lowly of heart, though he is. We also proclaim him as the one who will come again and judge the living and the dead. Motivates our mission. And for any of us who would be exploring the claims of Christ this morning, I just would humbly, I trust, put this before you. How you respond to Jesus this Easter week. Whether in humble repentance, faith and acceptance. Or in resistance. Dictates whether he will welcome you in to the new creation to be with him. Or to be with apart from him forever. There's no bigger decision you could make. And I'm sure we'd love to make space for any to say actually. What better week, Easter week. What better week to finally cross over that line. And kneel before the king in faith, knowing that I'll be with him forever.